What is up, everyone? This is your host, Eric Holtzman, and I want to welcome you to the Mindful Motion Podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Mindful Motion Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Holtzman, and today we have a very special guest with us. Joining us is Brenda Gutierrez, the founder of Infinite Bodies. Brenda was, wears many hats. She's a healer, a wellness coach, and an expert massage therapist. Through her work, Brenda guides individuals towards optimal health and fosters a balanced mind-body connection. Beyond her practice, Brenda curates transformative wellness retreats around the globe. These retreats offer a holistic blend of meditation, breath work, massage therapy, yoga, and much more. And it's all aimed at rejuvenating both mind, body, and soul. So today we're excited to delve into Brenda's journey, insights, and the profound impact of her work. Welcome, Brenda. How are you doing? Doing well. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. I'm excited to uh, you know get to know you a little more. Um, I know you help my parents by offering massage with them, and I'd love to just kind of get a sense of your background and how you got into doing the work that you do. So it the layers start with massage therapy, actually. I was about 12 when I first was trying to get curious as to like what that was. And then when I turned 16, I was working with my mom. She used to deliver linen to the hospitals, like the big roots. And I saw this like guy in like the nurse outfit massaging a, like a patient. And I was really like drawn back as to like what he was doing. Because I, I, again, at 12 years old, I, I saw my dad massage my mom. And I was like, what is that? Like, what are you doing? It's kind of odd. And so he's like, I'm relieving her tension. I'm like, okay. So I didn't know that it was actual a profession until I was 16. So I decided to enroll in school when I was 17. And so I went to a school called Massage School of Santa Monica. And the funny part, it was located in Old Town, Pasadena. <laughs> that's a silly name for something that's like an hour away from the location it says it's yeah at. for sure a hundred percent that's funny though i mean that happens a lot right there's all schools like all over the place not anywhere near their their home base um so this goes back really early for you then 12 years old is pretty soon to like kind of be curious about something that you're gonna do when you're you know an adult that's pretty awesome yeah, um, it's me because I never thought this would be something I carried through. Does that? It was just an interest. It was my hobby. Yeah, yeah. Family functions, and then my family would li literally be like, "Oh, I want you to massage my shoulders." So I had like them, my cousins, my uncles line up to like for me to like work on them, right? And so again, when I turned sixteen, and I I learned that you can hurt someone if you're not doing it properly, then that's when I was like, okay, like I want to learn more because I don't want to hurt anyone that I love. I didn't do it for profession. I did it mainly just because it was something I was intrigued about and I wanted to learn more about. That's so, uh, it's so in line with me too. Cause like when I was 13 or 14, I already started kind of like exploring training friends and whatnot. So it seems to be a thing um, amongst people in at least this health and wellness space. And yeah, to your point, like I just saw someone I had a consult with somebody who had sort of like the rolfing kind of technique on them. And it was an yeah. older lady and it blew up. She just had knee surgery. It blew up her calf. Like it looked like they almost ruptured something like uh, blood vessels or something like that because she had oh, a good God. amount of edema. So, yeah, you can definitely hurt somebody doing massage or anything to the body if you're not careful. Um, mm -hmm. I'm curious, did you have any like previous involvement in sports or I don't know, meditation, these other modalities that you seem to be involved with now um, when you were also a child or younger um, or was it just a massage that ignited the whole um, journey towards the other things? So it's funny, life has definitely been like a full circle without me, without my, I guess, consciousness. Um, I thought I was gonna be a detective. Like I wanted to go to school I was in, in college when I first started college. I was doing like criminal justice courses. Oh. Yeah, which is like, I never thought I would be a trainer or in the wellness space in general. 
Um, I've always been into sports, though. I love sports. I've played almost every sport you could think of. And so I gravitated more towards soccer, basketball, just because that's what was offered. Where I grew up was Fontana. So that was mainly, you didn't see like rugby and other sports like lacrosse or things of that nature. So I gravitated. I did a lot of soccer, basketball. I did a lot of swimming back in the day. I did water polo for a while. Nice. Um, so I've always been active per se. Yeah, the man, water polo is hard. Um, I never really did it, but I watched it and it's like, I can't imagine having to like swim and keep yourself up and play. It's, it's a rough sport. <laughs> it's great. It's, it's the best sport I think that's out there. But I mean, I'm biased, you know, it gets you in the best shape of your life for sure. Or that um, uh, <laughs> you ever get to play the underwater hockey. That that's crazy. Oh, I haven't seen that. No, <laughs> it's wild. The puck's under like twenty feet of water, and you have to go hold your breath and push it along, and like what? time each other. Go, people go up and down. You have to. It's crazy. I mean, I don't know. You have to have a really good ability to hold your breath to play that sport. Um, Damn, talk about breath work and pulmonary. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so you mentioned um, you went to massage school of Santa Monica, right? What was that like? What was the training like? How did the education um, formulate like your your process now? Well, it was a first foundation, right? So um, it's teaching technique and procedure, like effort, like how you start a massage with a flourage, and like what you're trying to do is ideally help your circulatory system embrace more of the heart not working as hard, right? To get full, um, how would I say, it? get full motion and proper sections. Because if you're working away from the heart, you're making the body stress out more. So the idea of massage is to calm the body and heal. So you want to promote let, more of like that digestive parasympathetic system more than like it gets you more aggravated, right? So yeah. learning little things like that, that was the foundation. And then as I started working in massage, I started doing more like workshops. So I worked in sports therapy for a while and I got certified through there. And then I also started working more into like Thai massage style because I thought that was like amazing the first time I ever had one on me and I was like oh man I need to learn how to do this because it, it's definitely a different style so my a style approach now is a combination of sports therapy very light Swedish mainly deep tissue and some Thai work in between. It's interesting you said it's all about the parasympathetic and that that always I mean, that makes sense to me, but uh, when you transition to the idea of doing deep tissue or, you know, dri like digging objects into things really kind of aggressively, that doesn't, to me, feel like it would be relaxing, especially how right. painful it can be. Does it still right. apply to those types of modalities or is that like a transition to a different I would say opera? so. It would depend on the therapist, right, on how fast they move because you can make something deep not feel so invasive mm -hmm. to the body which is essentially what you're trying to do is you'll create that parasympathetic if you just go slow like it's almost undetectable how slow you go to get deep and then you also have to have the client um work on their breath work so if their focus is mainly in breath then it's easier to create that space. The body starts to let go. It doesn't feel like it's a fight or flight response necessary. Sure. It's all about how you do it more so. Um, totally. What do you think, not to get too in the weeds of the science, but I mean, what do you think the main difference between doing something like, a, I'm assuming a Thai or Swedish is a little more surface, superficial, not as deep? versus i'm not sure versus uh you can correct me if i'm wrong but versus right. like something where you're really trying to get to the bone and really dig in or sink into the tissue what what would you say the difference is or what the difference might be happening to the nervous system or the body when you do them in different fashions like that 
Like when you combine them, you mean? Uh, when you go like lighter versus really trying to get deep into the tissue, what, what I guess, goal are you trying to accomplish between one or the other? I would say more flexibility with tie, right? Um, more range of motion. Being when you go deeper. When you're in the Thai Swedish kind of the superficial more. Okay. Um, Thai can be superficial, but it's more like the medium that connects the Swedish to the deep tissue work because it allows for fluidity to take place. So with the deep tissue, you press, let's say you have like upper traps crushing, like killing you because most of the time everybody's stress level is here. Their shoulders are up here, especially if they work on the computer a lot or things of that nature. Um, so in order to get them to relax, putting pressure points, creating pressure points for the deep tissue is allowing like the tissue to expand. So the, even the muscle starts to kind of open up, right? Because it's, it's create, you're creating the space with the pressure, right? And then as the Swedish part is to kind of move everything, just nice and slow pressure. And then the tie is more of like gaining that range of motion that let's say someone has a shoulder pain or shoulder problem, an impingement of some sort. If you go into like the lat or the supraspinatus and you press down, yeah, it's uncomfortable, but you do it more of a pulsation sensation and then you open up, you're, you're lengthening essentially the muscle. Does that make sense? So it, it, it allows for that like, ah, uh, kind of relaxation in the body. I see. Um, so the, it sounds like the main modalities of massage you use, like you said, were sports massage, Thai, Swedish, and deep. Yes, correct. Um, why were, why'd you choose those ones to learn or specialize in? Cause I know they have like, you know, ART and all these other different types. Right. Um, right. Why, why these particular ones? I just feel like they flow together um, and you can get more out of a person on the table with the four that I use. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong. There's other modalities out there, you know, that can, can aid, but these are the ones that I've had the, the, the most knowledge in and the most practice in. So the more you practice something, the more you can specialize in as mm -hmm. opposed to like going into other sectors and trying to like build up the same level of awareness that I have with these modalities. Um, and it's weird. It's like my, now my hands just kind of feel the the patient's body and I like it just knows where to press where not like the body communicates it's I don't know how to explain it <laughs> like it's just it's a sense it's a feeling no I get it I um I do similar hands-on stuff in a different way of course and you start to master your trade you start to pick up on nuances that aren't necessarily describable sort of an intuition if you will that comes right. to you an instinct I guess um so it sounds like you use all of these in some in some cases, depending on the person, you might use all the modalities in one session and have it, you kind of guide the body through a process to allow for the best result. Is that kind of correct or? Yeah, so my intention with every session for my clients is to get them to be more flexible and looser and feel looser in their body after each session and to gain or like open up the path to like more range of motion because essentially as you know as we get older everything starts to kind of get more limited and it's because we don't utilize the full planes of the body like we can we don't access a lot of positions i guess you could say so that's my goal when i work on my clients is to get them to feel more at ease, more mobile and less like tense overall. Now, I, I meant to ask this from backtracking a little bit, but going back to um, you mentioned you also do personal training. Um, right. I'm wondering how you got into that. And then did you do any other um, educational things for that particular part of your career or? Uh, like again, I, my roadmap has it sometimes feels like 
I started on the path and then I went off into a whole nother, I got lost and then I came back to an initial path. So in, while I was going to school for criminal justice, I then happened to move out here to Santa Monica College. And during my time there, I was playing a rugby for the club team here in Santa Monica and I injured myself. So I, I have an ACL tear and after that, I didn't have insurance, so I rehabbed myself. Uh, there was a girl on the team at the time that really just helped me out a lot. Like, I don't know what I would have done during that time because I couldn't do anything by myself. Like, you really take for granted your independence a lot of the time. Like, mm -hmm. you just need one thing to go off and then you're stuck, you know? And so... I went into, I, I got away from criminal justice because I didn't have documents at the time. And then I heard that what I wanted to do was going to be like 10 times harder because I didn't have the documentation. So then I decided to like retreat. I'm like, okay, what can I do to like make things a lot better? Um, and I got into kinesiology because again, the girl that was helping me, she had a, she was a kinesi major. So I kind of, she was like a guiding, I got like a form of guidance for me. And so that's how I started going into like more, okay, I'm going to be a PT. That's what I thought. I'm like going into physical therapy. And then I started working as a physical therapy assistant once I was in college, like once I transferred to Northridge, I worked in Beverly Hills at a physical therapy office. And I just didn't really like the whole, it was very monotonous. It was like the same thing over and over again. There was no like, I enjoyed working with the patients, but there was just, I wasn't allowed to, whatever I was learning in, in my classroom setting at the time, I was trying to put into the PT and they were just like, no, we're not doing that. Like that's too dangerous. We're just, we have a system and this is what we, and it was like the same thing over and over again. So I was like, I thought that was PT. Uh, now there's other physical therapy offices that I'm like, oh, like this is, this was so much more than what I thought it was going to be. But I was like, okay, I don't want to be a PT. Like, this is not something that like, I like helping them, but I don't want it to be monotonous. Like I need a little more flair. So then I went into athletic training. And so I did... I would go, I, I flew to Georgia to do an internship out there for about three months. Um, and I worked under the head coach of the Falcons team at the time. And so that was quite the experience. Like it was just so nice to see how they're structured. Everything was at faster pace. There was more, there was more action per se. Um, and then, but then, he even guided me to be like uh that you're looking at 12 to 16 hour days are you mm. really do you really love this that much or you know and i was like like do i is he goes plus the pay isn't great like you know and like, selling well, it well <laughs> and if you want to if you want to have a family that's going to be very hard in the future so he put a lot of things in my mind to think about and so i was like okay maybe that won't be so then I kind of took a step back and decided to work at a gym at the time. So I've been through almost every gym. I've got, I worked for Equinox, South Bay, uh, LA Fitness, 24 Hour Fitness. Like, and what I've noticed is, except for Equinox, all the other gyms was more of a sales position more than anything. I was a trainer, but like it wasn't like fundamentally centered into that. So I was like, I don't like that. I want to help, right? So then I started working for myself after I graduated college um, with my bachelor's and I, here I am still doing workshops, like lengthening the, the amount of education that I have in other workshops because there's so many out there. And so I'm more of a hands-on anyway. So I enjoy these like workshops where you just stay and you're learning just how everybody is different. And the staple of what 
I guess the fitness industry per se is trying to do is like put everybody in one box. Mm. It, it is much more than that because it's not just about the six pack abs that they promote or like drastic weight loss. It's more about like the mind aspect for me and how that ties into eventually getting the results you want. So now that's kind of my home space. Got it. I, so you- I went all over the place, but the, yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, that's in line. You did go all over the place with uh, with your journey. It sounds like what that's sometimes what you got to do, right? You got to you got to explore and figure out where you land. Um, yeah. And I'm I'm very similar too. I went worked in box gyms, and I did not like the way it was set up. Um, so it it has a place, of course. Definitely. It has it's got its pitfalls as well. Um, okay, so back to the the thing you were talking about, about range of motion, I'm just out of curiosity, because I don't ever see this with massage very often. Do you actually do, um, you know, range of motion assessments, or do you have people moving while you're massaging them? Like, how does that tie into the massage, the range of motion thing? Or is it just a matter of like, after you do the massage, people just seem to move better? Well, before they get on my table, um, if it's the first time for a client, then I want to get what their intention is with the work, right? There's different reasons for why people do massage. Um, so most of the time is to relieve pain. So I kind of ask, okay, like, where's the pain? What happened? How long have you had the pain? So there is a protocol that I follow. I go through seeing like where their range of motion is. And then from there, we put them on the table and I just kind of start because verbally they're telling me something and from I've done this work for going on 18 years now uh, for massage and over the years I've learned the patient tells me something but then the body tells me something completely different right so it I get the assessment through them when they're standing and then once they're on the table I do my own like hands-on assessment of like what I feel the body is the body's a roadmap. It really just tells you everything. And the more you kind of tune in to just kind of feeling things out and like being more intentional of like what could be going on, what does it feel the same on both sides, you know, things of the, like that start to kind of come out. And that's another assessment that I do. And then I start to kind of work the tissue and kind of move their arm around if i'm working on shoulder mobility if i'm working on hip mobility then i'll work more on the glutes and try to get into their psoas muscle which is a little invasive sometimes but it allows a lot of relief right so yeah that's a painful area for a lot of people oh my god yeah for both i mean as a therapist too because to get in there it's a lot of work (laughs) (laughs) you um so it sounds like uh you're saying someone comes in, they have a shoulder pain, maybe it is, and then they're telling you how it feels, how it happened. And of course you take that information in the back of your mind, but sometimes it's not presenting as if that's where the problem is necessarily. Right. right. Following wherever it seems to be um, issues, whether it's movement or the quality of sensation or whatever it is that you pick up on. It's not always the pain area. That's always hard for people to understand. Like, oh, I have a pain here right here it's yeah. like well it's maybe not the problem <laughs> I mean, it, it could be understandable sometimes but very rarely mm-hmm. more often than not it's somewhere completely different you know it's a radiating pain most of the time yeah yeah and that's always tricky you have to for people who definitely don't do this as a profession they don't really get it but eventually i'm sure if you work with someone long enough they start to understand that right and i think that that is the cool thing about our profession is we're teaching them the tools we have learned to kind of assess themselves, right? Because it's about empowering them at the end of the day and yeah. getting them more intuitive within their body themselves. Because a lot of people are so disconnected, as you, I'm sure you can relate. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sometimes it's just putting their mind on it. And sometimes there's literally a physical change where they can't sense things. And that it's a whole different animal when it comes to restoring that. But um, I'm wondering 
what your thoughts are. Like, why do you think people enjoy massages? Why do you think your clients um, find it to be an enjoyable process? Well, first of all, they're not doing anything. So, I mean, most people like to just lay there and hang out versus physically go do something. Um, not to say it's a bad thing. Like, I love massages for that reason, right? Like, I just lay there and somebody else gets to move my limbs in all kinds of directions and press most, like, it, tight areas in my body that kind of need attention and support. So, I would say primarily is to recover most of the time, right? To bring more movement, which reduces more stress, right? Because you have more fluidity, fluidity going on, yeah. body, right? I think it's a word. Yeah, I'm like, I think it's a word, yeah. Most of the time we also have a lot of scar tissue due to injury or like overuse of a limb or just chronic pain just because over the years we've done something or we probably sit a certain way that we don't really pay attention to, it's unconscious, or we walk a certain way, instead of having normal gait patterns, we're kind of like either pigeon toe or duck toe or one's in one direction, the other one's straight, right? Like our body's always trying to compensate for things, injuries that we've had in the past, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that's mainly like the reason why people, plus you, get off the table if, if the therapist is good and you just feel like euphoric, you know, like who doesn't, you have so many chemicals in the body going nuts. Hmm. So I think that is the main reason. And what would you say some of the main health benefits are from doing massage or receiving it, I guess? You said what? What would you say then like some of the main health benefits are for getting massages? Well, it boosts immune function, right, in the body. You're you're helping everything just kind of perform better because you're creating higher blood flow, right? More circulation, more oxygen to areas that maybe not necessarily get enough oxygen, right? I would say reduction in stress and anxiety a lot of the time because your mind kind of turns off for a bit if mm. you focus on breath as well. Um, I try to have my clients breathe, they'll do a lot of breath when I do body work, just because it'll allow them to think of me. It's hard for them to breathe. It, like their inhale through the nose, exhale through the mouth. It gets them outside of their mind. Mm -hmm. Our mind is nonstop for the majority of us, right? So that creates fatigue. And when you allow that, like a break in that aspect, I think it enhances a lot of just kind of more of a relaxation overall in the body and allows you to kind of tone down. I would say my favorite part of the massage is that people gain flexibility, mm. like just from one session, which is, I think, incredible when people are very stiff. Yeah, being able to move is kind of a, kind of a big thing. Um, yeah. So taking that sidetrack away from just massage, I mean, thinking of health and wellness, how would you personally define health and wellness? So health is essentially, by definition, more of a, the disease aspect of things in the body, right? I would think more of nutrients, like what you're consuming, not only like in, in what the food you consume, but like what you're reading, the, what thoughts you're allowing to like, stay in your mind constantly, right? Um, and then the wellness, I think, goes a little deeper, which I I think is found to be more of my practice. I would say wellness goes to more of a holistic aspect to it. You're looking at more like not just the physical and the internal, but also like spirit and just kind of combining it's like the triangle for me you got okay. your mind body and spirit all in one and then the deeper you go within your mind the more you can also go within your practice if that makes any sense so i think i think it makes sense do you do you see these things as separate concepts or like interconnected aspects of your well-being uh so both like 
they are separate, but then they come together. It's kind of like the circles where yeah, you get what I'm saying. Like there's overlap. Mm -mm. Like they do have separate parts to it, but then there's big overlap overall. Yeah, I can't yeah. remember what that was called. <laughs> right? So I'm like yeah. I'm going back to school. I'm like, yeah, like what was the term? You know? <laughs> yeah. Not yeah. I think people know what that means, though. I mean, we all have seen the two circles that overconnect, and there's like a little inside yeah, section in the middle. I don't remember. <laughs> um, sixth grade, fifth grade, one of those. Yeah. Man, that's crazy. I can't remember. That's not important anyway. Yeah, I think that that makes sense, though. I mean, they're separate entities, but they interconnect in some some way. Um, so I, I think that. They do. That and I feel like wellness is more of a lifelong thing overall. You know, health is more like in the moment, present, like you're taking your uptaking and then wellness is like you're essentially doing it for longevity. Hmm. OK, so going back to exercise, personal training seems like a big part of your life or it has been. It seems mm -hmm. like it still is. Right. Yes. Um, does exercise play a role in your practice or the advice you give to clients? For my massage clients? Uh, well, I suppose maybe them, or do you do training and massage with some people, or is it just training? Like, what's I it look like? I think it's important to have both. Um, you get more out of it. I've had I I develop packages mainly to have both because the benefits coincide. If it, a lot of people going heavy into training but then they don't do enough recovery work, right? There's like so many scopes. You could do sauna, you could do meditation, right? Practices, just regular stretching um, versus just having to go and get the heart rate up and like grab heavy weights, right? Like they overlap. So for mine, I use both of them for a lot of clients. Some clients are like, oh, I don't know about that yet. It takes them a while to like, warm into it um i've had several clients that started with training and then they they became aware of like how to train on their own and then they still utilize me for massage um i have a pretty good track record on both fields like my massage therapy work i have yet a person over the last 18 years tell me that they were unsatisfied or anything so that makes me i feel like a Guinness World Record, I'm trying to keep on to myself. Um, I'm always trying to improve that part because that helps people more even at a later stage in life. Because personal training is amazing and I love it, but there's certain clients that, let's say age group, they're like 80, you know, and they can't do a lot of things because they're very limited. Then my massage work has been very, beneficial for me to be able to utilize and the training just looks a lot different than it would for like people our age or in their 50s yeah as it should <laughs> um so i guess it's a two-part question how do you feel physical activity exercise complements the benefits of massage and then conversely um how do you think massage benefits or complements physical activity so in physical activity, you're, you're pumping iron, right? You're sharpening your iron, technically. The massage would be like you putting that, that heat of iron in water to chill out, right? So that it doesn't overwork. I, I talk metaphorically a lot of times. So uh, cool. <laughs> I hope that paints a picture. Uh, yeah, so I would say it complements it because it allows you to connect with your body and slow down um, versus be like on, on a roll the entire time. And okay. if you notice when you take a break from things, when you're exhausted, you're really able to exert a lot more when you go back in versus just staying on a, on a level of constant motion without any recovery. The recovery allows you to just enhance more of the strength that you're trying to build, right? And more and less of like that chronic pain and tightness and stiffness that 
we create in our bodies on a day to day, not just because of the physical fitness that we're doing, but the mental aspect of working your mind either for work or for your personal, just like overanalyzer. Yeah, I can see how those would go well together. One's revving you up sympathetically and the other's kind of bringing you back down, keeping you in that balanced homeostatic position. Um, yeah, for sure. I mean, I, it sounds like you personally exercise and have your own routine. What does that look like? Kind of varies and varies depending on like my client schedule, right? Like I have, but people cancel and then I get new ones. So ideally I like to try to get up about 530 to have like 30 minutes to myself. There are days for sure that that doesn't happen because my bedtime ends up being at 11 and then um, I like to prioritize my sleep these days. Before I would just be like, four hours, that's enough. That's just mm. fine. But as I'm getting wiser, it's like I'm working against myself in that respect. So I would try to get up at 5.30, do more like a flexibility, mental kind of shift and like intention for the day. And then I have my first client to clear around seven. So I have to leave here about 6.15. So I have exactly 30 minutes and 15 minutes to get ready and head out the door to start my full functioning day. I try to go for like a run two to three times a week just to build. Um, right now I'm coming back from an ankle injury. So I'm like slowly trying to build up the mileage once again. So, And then I do two to three strengthening like heavy weightlifting sessions a week as well. Got it. Yeah, it's funny how so many of us in the health and wellness space have time, barely any time to take care of our own. Follow the group. Yeah, for sure. But we have to create that time for ourselves because if we don't, then like, what are we doing? We're doing a disservice for sure. Yeah, it's, you got to do it yourself to also know and then grow in your career too. It's just, it is funny though. You run out of time. You really have to prioritize it. Um, no, melting clock all the way, especially once things get more like your family's growing or you have other responsibilities just come out of nowhere, you know, like mm -hmm. it changes a lot of things, but yeah, that is a very important thing for, I think our health practitioners in general to like prioritize, even if it's 30 minutes, I yeah. think it's important to like, prioritize and find what would work best for you. You can do a lot in 30 minutes. Um, so what are some of the, the common issues, conditions, um, you know, pains that people like seek your help with to resolve? So I deal with a lot of like shoulder impingements, shoulder problems, and just lack of hip mobility. A lot of people are just not aware that they kind of coincide like whatever's going on in your shoulders is most likely going on in the hip section as well and so i would say that's kind of my fuerte is trying to get people realigned in gaining and accessing like full mobility even on both sides okay and when you have someone with some of these things come in you do your sort of protocol that you mentioned, you start working with them, maybe you're doing exercise, maybe you're not. Um, aside from those two things, what other techniques or practices do you incorporate with um, when you work with these people? A lot of breath work. Okay, and, and what does that look like? So it's mainly guiding them through like inhalation for four count per se, right? A lot of people are mouth breathers, like that's yeah. like primarily. And they're missing out. I, I don't mean it in a bad way. I'm just, I think initially you want to try to get your mind to work more. Inhale through the nose, exhale through the mouth. Um, and then that practice will help generate just more evenness in the body, if that makes any sense. Um, so I, I like to incorporate a lot of that. I try to incorporate journaling. Uh, for a lot of my clients because I think we have a lot in our minds and if we put it on paper it'll be easier to sort out or process things or kind of get on paper like what you want and then be able to shift it but it's hard it's a hard practice sometimes for my older clients to get into so 
I mean, it's a work in progress, but yeah. I think those two things are something major that I try to push on to my clients in, in the practice outside of the training and getting all sweaty and strong and stuff like that. I mean, it's, it's definitely the proof is in the pudding. I mean, that's a well documented research to, uh, set of things that people have had a lot of benefit from doing, especially the journaling. It's just hard to do. Sometimes you feel kind of silly writing your feelings and your thoughts. Um, but when you start, it does, it does seem to influence the way you think about things and go back to bizarre, what you wrote. Right? Huh? <laughs> it's bizarre. how It's just like actually taking the time to do those things. Like your subconscious, like, I think ends up working over time when you're, just like out and about doing other things, you know? Yeah, yeah, you go into like automatic mode and you're not necessarily aware of your thoughts or what your, what your train, like your general consensus is on a day-to-day -day basis. If you track it, you can look back and you say, oh, I have this sort of consistent thing that I'm not really loving. And then you can start to maybe reflect on it and change your perspective or something like that. Right. Um, you know, you mentioned this, I'm not sure, um, if you can describe it differently, but when you were talking about breathing through your nose and you said it was kind of creating this evenness in the body, I'm wondering like what you meant or what you were thinking when you said that. Some evenness. Um, it, it just gives your body enough time to like actually do something with the oxygen you're taking in, right? When, I mean, science overall research has shown you only get like 30% of like the breath that you intake. And so, I mean, there's mixed reviews on what type of um, ratio per se it is, but about 30%. And so if you're breathing through your mouth, you're, you're most likely getting a lot less than that. So I feel like that creates more, less equilibrium in the body versus like being able to really initiate like full breath in, full breath out. And then you also are not breathing just within the nose, but also expanding the walls of your abdomen per se, and then breathing mm -hmm. back in. So there is proper great ways to breathe. We just, one, we, we forgot, because if you look at a baby, they breathe perfectly. And like their, their abdomen is like extended and then it, bring, it comes back down when they breathe out. And somewhere along the lines, we just kind of lose it. Just kind of like playing in the playground. Like we go on the monkey bars. It's like no big deal. Try going to do that right now. It's not going to be as like gracious, you know? So. I see. Okay. Yeah. So now let's, um, I wanted to dive in just a little bit into the wellness retreat thing. I know you organize these. Um, yes. I'm not sure if you do it by yourself or with someone else, but. Before going into like the specifics, how did you first, you know, get involved in doing, you know, the wellness retreats? So the wellness retreats kind of started. Uh, I took a trip to Thailand, and my partner, she was on the beach with me. We're just sitting, and we we're in Phuket. I remember so clearly, like we we're just in awe of like the beauty of just being somewhere else and connecting with a different culture. And I was just taken back and I, I wanted, I thought like that thought process in my mind was like, it would be so cool to have people just come and experience this, you know, cause we get here in the U S I feel like you just get stuck in the grind, like monotonously just grinding it out, trying to like just work, work, work. Um, and so I'm like, what if I just bring people here to, one, they experience a new culture, two, they experience things that they see on TV, like, oh, I don't know, scuba diving or whitewater rafting or like things that you're just like, oh, that'd be so cool to do, you know? But you never kind of get around to it. It just, it goes on a bucket list that you never reflect on trying to make happen. And next thing you know, you wake up and you're 65 and you're just like, man, I wish I would have done something like that. Mm. And I, based on the clients that I've had, my more elder clients, that's kind of what I thought about. I'm like, what if I can kind of just shake people up a little just by exposure and have them change a little bit of like their life experience? Because life is happening right now and it happens so fast. 
So then I came back to the U.S. Three months later, I took a, about 12 people to Thailand with me, and we set up this amazing villa, and we would wake up early in the morning, get some fitness in, have nourishment, like, waiting for us right after our dirt workout. We had, like, amazing food, and then we would go explore, go on adventure, and it was amazing to see a lot of people just connect with themselves and just quiet out the noise for a week. Okay, and that means that, you're selling it on me. I want to go now. <laughs> <laughs> after that, I was just like, oh, no, I can see myself putting this on more and more. And also, I want there to be more connection, not only within yourself, but also community within the participants because they didn't know each other on that one we had the youngest guy was 23 and the oldest i believe she was 67 oh so that's like big, that's a big that's range big. you know yeah. and everybody had a great time we all connected on different levels right and you you were just able to be open and kind of put walls down connect with yourself and also connect with the culture, the people there. They were Thai. People are amazing. Like, they're just just so warm. And I don't know. I want to do more of that because eventually I want to be able to just give more to, like, the people that are there, you know, because I feel like we're just blessed here in the States and we're just beyond gifted with everything we have and mm. give a little bit away that, I think that just helps. So you mainly do these in Thailand, it sounds like. It'll be November 11th to the 17th, and we will be in Indonesia. Oh, okay. So different places and not always the same person. No. And then the next year, we got Zanzibar. I love different places. Yeah. So when obviously it's going to change depending on the place you go, but like what kind? I, what, if someone goes, what can the participants expect from attending? Like, what's you know the general? So the way I like to run it is it's kind of set up like a cruise. You, I don't know for those that have been on cruises, there's like an itinerary set. Mm -hmm. you're, you're able to participate in whatever you want to take off. Um, and whatever, you're just kind of like, I'm too tired. I kind of want to sit back and be with myself or go to explore on my own. Then you have the willingness and the freedom to do that. But there's time slots where we have certain activities that we are going to be doing. And it's all inclusive. It's kind of like an all inclusive. Um, you get your meals paid for, the activities are included. The only thing that I don't include now is flights because that was a mess. <laughs> I can imagine some people maybe yeah. want to upgrade or whatever. Yeah, it was it, it was something I'll never do again for sure. Like, I, and it's not because I don't because I'm always trying to overdo what I do. Like, I I want to go above and beyond for people. That makes me happy. Um, so now I'm like, okay, maybe I get to dumb it down a little and like give people like the the power within themselves to do a part of it themselves. You know, so. I don't, I no longer do the, the flight included, but everything else, once you land in whatever destination, for example, in November when we're in Lombok, once you land in the airport, you have the shuttle waiting for you, you get picked up, and you, when it's over, you get dropped off again at the airport, unless you, you have other plans to kind of go explore and extend your vacation, so. So it might look like a plan workout, some breath work, yoga, correct. all that so, kind of stuff. Correct. So usually I have another trainer uh, on, on with me, and we take turns at uh, different modalities. So it, it'll start off with breath work in the morning, maybe intuitive journaling, and then eating breakfast, and then starting out the plan of the day. And then coming back together at night and doing maybe some yoga, for example, or mobility flows to kind of reset and then do do it all over again. Maybe get up early, go for a hike, like a morning sunrise or whoever decides to come on. Watch like beautiful waterfalls, just be immersed yourself in nature, come back, 
he kind of spent some time connecting with the group, getting ready for the next event. And then the next morning we have the same thing, either a, a workout structure laid out or a mobility flow going on. It, it, varies, it varies dependent on like how many people end up fully coming through. Cause right now we just, right now we have three people with deposits like guaranteed and we have about eight more more spots open. So okay. we still got a long time. Number, pardon me? You still got a long time till November, so. Yeah, I'm sure it'll, we haven't promoted it. Um, so I, I'm sure once I put it out there, we, we will get the parts. They usually fill up pretty fast. So um, yeah, that's and, kind of, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, absolutely. It sounds very health and wellness centric. I'm assuming based on the design of this, do you do it all by yourself? Um, no. So my partner, Kelly, in this is she's in charge of like the background and like connecting with the location we're going to be staying at, um, making sure that everything is all set up as far as the activities that we agreed upon with like the people there. And then, so she's com more communication, and then, and then after that, I do everything else. Got it. Um, we do have one videographer that does more of like he's going to start working more onto the social media aspect, and just making it the imaging just talk and express what we're all about. Yeah, that's smart. I mean, that will help push it out there more. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, these days everyone's on the psychedelic train. You guys incorporate that into the experience? Um, no, we've we've talked about it in the sense of like playing around with the idea. Um, maybe in the future, depending on more research, I kind of want to know a little more. I I personally think psychedelics have a place and a space for kind of interpersonal work. Mm -hmm. um, but I not necessarily think in the next one we would have something like that. But maybe like far more into the future, I do think I wouldn't see why not. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, definitely have seen lots and heard lots of crazy things and benefits from doing it. What kind of benefits have participants, you know, when they go to these retreats, what, what are they reported experiencing? Like some of the changes in their mind, body, whatever it might be. So in the past, it's been maybe more of, one participant was very open. She's like, wow, like I've never connected with myself since I was a little girl. And now I can, I feel like I can feel my emotions and I want to do more of that. Right. So I thought that was a beautiful one of like the group workshops, I think kind of brought that about, like she was mm -hmm. allowed to be vulnerable with herself and open up more. Um, so I guess that's more of connection within self. I had another participant just be like, wow, like I didn't think I can go on vacation and find time to like move and work out. Like, and it didn't feel like a chore. It was actually nice and I felt empowered. So that kind of makes me feel like, okay, it's not just a thought or a vision that I have. It's also that it, it does work and it can work for people. And that's essentially, I want to make the connection that, you can find your best lifestyle inactive, making it active. You know, it doesn't have to be like what the median shows, which is like, oh, you have to just push hard every time. You just have to find what works best for you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the stuff out there that's popular is really not real for most people. <laughs> it's just entertaining, really. Mm -hmm. um, in your opinion, what would you say the foundational pillars are for creating the healthiest body and mind? At the core, it's your mind. Your, your way to connect with your mind and to what is, and keeping it open to what is possible. Because a lot of the time you're like, oh, I can't do that. Or I shouldn't do that. You know, like you start just creating this story of what you can't do versus like, I'm just gonna go do. So you're giving yourself permission to just go and play ideally. And fundamentally, I would say mobility is at the, 
at my sec number two for me for just overall health you're you're working on your mobility which is flex flexibility which is being able to move in all planes of motion in a strong way versus just in like the frontal and sagittal plane right um and being very mindful of what you're consuming like i would say those are the three main things for like overall health and then obviously strength and conditioning incorporated into that because as you know we lose bone density after a certain age and so we want to keep as much power in our limbs and bones as we can so the best way to do that is through strength training got it so it's like movement strength nutrition and mental well-being sounds pretty on point to me um you know, just we're almost done here, but I'm I'm wondering, you know, what kind of dreams, aspirations do you have for your career <clears throat> in health and wellness? Like, where do you see yourself going? There's so many places. Like, I just have to reach out and kind of make a better placement. But I want to be able to create like wellness centers in different parts of the world, and so I essentially is connecting my fitness, my massage and my retreats into that one thing. Hmm. So that is where I envision my career moving towards. And it's just, there's a lot, there's a lot of steps in between that I get to kind of hone in on as so, I get there. So kind of like what you're doing now, but on a bigger scale to reach more people. Correct. And then to do more, because so what I my vision is I will have different wellness centers like where I will do my retreats at my own center. Like, so it would be in Thailand. I'll have something in Costa Rica, Colombia, Zanzibar. For sure, those are the ones that I like see myself having something there to build and have it's helping the community the culture there, because then I can, they're exposed to something and that creates opportunity in, in the land. And then it also creates opportunity for people to go and explore and do things. And so that's kind of like a big vision that I want to fulfill for sure. That's great. I mean, that's admirable because you're not just using their space just to do what you want, but you're also trying to bring them into the picture. I think that's, that's wise. And I mean, amazing too, because we're all human. We should all, you know, love each other and be together in some respects. So you're not excluding the local people necessarily. No, that, that is, we get to. I mean, again, I feel like we are privileged. A lot of us, we're here. Even if you are low income, you're privileged. If you were to go outside to other parts of the world, you'll see how privileged you are. Yeah. You know, and so I kind of, I'm. I'm from Colombia, you know, my mom brought me when I was little, like the amount of people that have the same story that I do, I, I think feel the same way in, in that respect. So I want to do something with this privilege that I feel that I, I got this golden ticket. And so I want to be able to see what I can do that is much bigger than myself. That's a good way to, to motivate yourself to do more for sure. Um, Definitely. If you could go back in time and speak to yourself like 10 years ago, what kind of advice would you give yourself? So I would definitely say just focus on the vision more and myself more. I, I allowed myself to get a little distracted with just life. And it allowed, I allowed it to slow me down versus just kind of throwing myself with everything I have to the vision I have. So I see. Yeah. Keep the, the main picture top of mind and not get bogged down by the day to day stuff. Or the doubts, right? That arise with people you know. Yeah, especially the people closest to you are the ones that doubt you the most. Uh, many times. And so their fears become your fears because you take their words like at a higher level than your own mm. sometimes or at least i'm just speaking for myself 
Yeah, that is so true. And also, I mean, if they're family, you can't do anything about, but people that are like that, they're just selective, maybe not the best people to have around, I admit, in some cases. Definitely. It's just listening to your inner voice more and like just trusting that you know best for you. I think yeah. that would be the biggest. In, in summation, that would be the answer to your question. Okay. Well, I know uh, you're super busy, so I don't want to keep you here much longer. But, you know, could, what people wanted to find you, um, find more information about your massage services or the upcoming wellness retreats, where would they where would they find that information? So you can find me at Infinite Bodies on Instagram. And so it's I N I F I N I T E and then bodies is B O D Y Z. And so for the retreats, it's vitality retreats. Um, so those are the two handles on Instagram and you're welcome to send me a private message. If you have any questions, if you like, there's a link in my bio that has all the websites that you can access either massage or training or, just take a look at our Vitality retreats and what's going on in there. Is there like a, a cutoff time if someone wants to do it for the retreats? Do they have to do it in a certain amount of in advance? Yeah, so we try to keep it uh, a month in advance. So our November, by November, October, like mid-October, we will be closing out. But I think we'll be sold out by then. So it's just a matter of you saving your, your spot. A lot okay. of people tend to do a deposit because they can't put it all up front or they put it on a credit card. Um, but ideally, it's just reserving your space. Okay, cool. Well, uh, I really appreciate you taking the hour to like chat about this. I think uh, people will find a lot of this information really awesome and you know, maybe reach out and learn more about the retreats and potentially go. I mean, I want to go, so... <laughs> Oh, man, you should come through. Seriously. I know. It's hard to do things these days with two kids. <laughs> I'm sure it, it does create a little bit more of a limitation. In the future, we we are working on having, like, family retreats. Oh, cool. For that reason, a lot of my clients are like, yeah, but I have my kids. Can they come? I'm like, they can, but it'll be a little more challenging, I'm sure. You know, yeah. so I'm going to create one just for families. That, yeah, because you have to create a whole different list of things to do for a little while. Well, because then I have to accommodate, right? It'll, and the vision right now is there will be um, classes for kids to stay active and be in there. And then there'll, there'll be classes for adults going on simultaneously so that it can create that space that is needed to reconnect. Because as with family, you're... As a couple, you have to reconnect. And with yourself, you have to create that reconnection mm -hmm. in order to provide for the whole ecosystem. Or at least that's how I see it. So No, I mean, it totally. Absolutely makes sense. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, I will let you get out of here. Thank you again. And maybe we can uh, do another one in the future. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Eric. I'll right. take it. Have a good one. Bye.